Hey guys, what is going on? In this video, I wanted to cover something that is very, very near and dear to my heart that you probably have all seen me cover in the past, and that is, of course, the iPad Pro Magic Keyboard Case. This thing is still freaking awesome. Now, just a quick reminder, if you enjoy the type of videos I've been making, you enjoy this iPad content, you enjoy the MacBook content, all that fun stuff, please consider leaving the video a like and consider subscribing as it would greatly benefit the channel and it would help me out a ton. So thank you. And there are also gonna be timestamps all over this video. So if you go to the description or you just hover your mouse over the video, you're gonna see all the timestamps, all the topics that I'm talking about throughout the video. So feel free to skip around if I tend to be rambling on way more than I should. All right, enough rambling. Let's get into the first topic of this. And that's just overall how I still feel about this device because feelings change. Three months down the line, I still feel like this thing is a beautiful device. The floating hinge, just every single aspect of this thing is still like amazing to me every single day I use it. Putting it on desk, just going through it, using the trackpad, using the keyboard, the aspect ratio of the iPad in general, how it feels on the, on the Magic Keyboard. Everything is just still like a huge wow factor to me. And I just wanted to express that because I know that there's a wow factor to certain new things. So whenever I got this in the mail, that first video I made, I was like so ecstatic about it. Like I was so hyper to be using it and just talking about all the beautiful design aspects of it. That still exists today. I am still in shock every time I use this because of its floating nature and like how the hinge feels, just everything about it is still like, it's still pristine. So I wanted to just make sure you guys know that. My feelings for this have not changed. There are a little bit of like quirks and stuff like that that I've dealt with that I want to talk about in this video especially, but overall the look, feel, still perfect. All right, so now the second thing I want to jump into is the build quality and more specifically, how did it hold up over time? So I know that there were a lot of doubts about this thing because of the material, how it compares to the smart folio keyboard. And we've seen, I don't know if you've seen, but I've seen a lot of horrible pictures of people's smart folio keyboards after like years of use. Difference is smart folio keyboard is about half the price of this guy. Yes, there are stains. Yes, there's like little smudges. It picks up fingerprints really easily. But the overall build of this thing, like how it actually is holding up the seams, especially stuff like this, where a lot of people said that this would tear over a while, especially for their smart folio keyboard. This is still very, very solidly packed together. Now, let me show you what I mean about the stains, especially. Okay, so you could see like on the back that yeah, there's smudges, there's stuff you gotta like wipe off with a paper towel or something like that. I don't even know if you could wet the paper towel. I don't know if this material is good for moisture. Probably not, don't do that. But you can kind of see that it's stuff that could come off. It's nothing like permanent. There's no rips, there's no tears, there's no like huge gashes in this thing. And if you go to the front side, or actually technically this is the back side, if we check out here, it's the same stuff. This doesn't really hit the table, so this side doesn't get hit as hard. And of course, the overall keyboard and stuff like that, this spot looks still brand new. Obviously, again, you have little smudges and stuff, but these are things that's gonna happen to any device that you own. But the one thing that's important is the scratches and the tears that happen and the ripped seams that tend to happen over time, especially with the smart folio keyboard. And I said it in my original review that this material feels like slightly different than the smart folio keyboard. And I still stand by that because my experience with the smart folio keyboard versus this guy, totally different. Now, while the build quality is still like perfect to me, I am still, and I will never get over this, I am weary about putting this on like a dirty table or like a table with crumbs on it or stuff like that because this material, nothing's happened to it yet, but I have the feeling that over time it is gonna get like really ratty and stuff like that. I'm not sure, I can't say for sure, but just something to look out for. Overall though, build quality is still perfect three months later. Okay, so the next topic I wanna to talk about, topic number three, is the weight of this thing. And I'm talking about the weight because a lot of people still to this day tend to dislike the whole weight aspect of this. And it's actually a really like controversial topic for some reason. So I wanna put my insight on this. In the first video that I made with the initial impressions, I said that the weight was, it was heavy, but like it doesn't seem to be that bad. And I'm not gonna change my thoughts on that, but there is one thing that I'm starting to realize. And that is the weight of the Magic Keyboard, the weight of the iPad, it is heavy, don't get me wrong. But if it's your only device, that's really not a big deal. You throw it in your bag. If your bag's like well padded or it, it like has a good harness system, stuff like that, really like, you know, techie features about a bag, it's not bad. But if you do what I do and you carry the Magic Keyboard, the iPad, the MacBook, uh, and then your books, your accessories, your charger, stuff like that, yeah, it does get really heavy. The MacBook and the iPad, don't quote me on this, but I think it's as heavy or heavier than the MacBook. And I know that it's thicker than the MacBook for sure, because this thing does add a decent amount of chunk to this guy. 
but the weight distribution of this, I will still stand by that. It is perfectly distributed. What I mean by that is if you were to put this guy on a table and you were to try and tip it over or something, it's really, it's not gonna tip over unless you obviously like force it. The way they gave you the possible viewing angles and like the hinge work and everything, it is, it is very well done. And it's done to a specific degree for a reason. Pretty sure Apple knows that if you tip this thing way too far back, it's gonna fall. So they obviously limited you to this angle. Angle though, still not a problem. This little range of motion that you have is more than enough for what I've been using it for, whether it's on my lap, on the table, anything like that. And keep in mind that this is still just the case. Like the iPad does come off and that's something that is gonna always impress me. And actually tying into the next feature about the hinge and everything is the hinge itself and how it held up over time. Cause I know a lot of people were like a little bit iffy on how the hinge is gonna hold up over time because this is a very stiff thing. Like, I don't know how to explain it. It's like, you need a lot of force to go through this. So a lot of people thought that over time, the hinge was gonna get looser and looser and then just become less effective. I can say at least after three months, that has not happened. The hinge is still very, very stiff as much as it could. Like I can literally leave it open that much or maybe a little less, uh, maybe a little less. All right, then it starts to close. But the hinge is still very stiff. Everything still works with the hinge specifically. So I have no complaints there. I just want to do like a brief touch on this because I know a lot of people might be like iffy about how the hinge is gonna hold up over time. So if you wanna take my word for it, the hinge, I don't see this thing, it's fine. Now there is one thing that I did in my other video, the impressions of me trying to literally pry this case open because it's still so difficult to open. And while I did figure it out, I will forever stand by what I said that Apple needs to change this in some way. Like this is crazy. It shouldn't be this difficult to open. Let me show you guys my updated method of opening it really quick. Okay, so we have the magic keyboard here and everything. Let's lift this guy up. Let's put it on its hinge. Let me make sure this is in frame. And you can just grab it while it's on its hinge and pull it down. This is a much easier way of doing it. It's still not perfect. Like I think Apple needs to rework the whole hinge of this thing, but totally works, that's fine. Still though, opening it with one hand, even with this method, it's still kind of tough and it's honestly kind of scary. Hold on. Yeah, I don't like that at all. I think this needs to be reworked, but if you have two hands, definitely just on its hinge, grab it, pull it down and you're in. So while this hinge definitely does need to be rethought in my opinion, at least, I got used to it. I got used to the whole opening mechanism of it. Not my favorite still, but I can work with it until Apple figures out a better way to do this. Maybe like, I'm not even sure. Cause this, like the iPad itself is gonna be hard to open. Cause this is like a boxy design. So even if they put a lip here to like grab, I'm pretty sure the whole case is gonna lift up. And the segue from the hinge work into the next topic is flawless. And that is the writing for this guy. The hinge really, really limits the whole like iPad-esque aspect of this case and this whole setup. Because if you wanna take your pen and you wanna write on this guy, this is not comfortable. Like I, I would not recommend you to write while it's actually hooked onto the Magic Keyboard. Even if you tilt it in any direction, it's just not great. I know people had like this thing going on where they can flip it over or something like that. Like I think they did it like that and they like rested it on the table. So that way you have like a good, this is really scary, hold on. That way you have like a good writing platform for this. Guys, it, no, no, you should not be doing that. That's, that's it, looks, it looks weird, let's just be honest. And also, even if you did that, even if you thought that was a good idea, if you press up here, this is just gonna collapse in on itself. It's not a solution. This is something that Apple definitely needs to rethink. And it's something that I struggled with with the Magic Keyboard. Probably the only struggle I had with the Magic Keyboard, honestly, is that whenever I wanted to use this thing as an iPad, if I wanted to take notes for class, I had to take it off the case. And if I didn't have like another folio case around to like put it in and keep it there for a while while I'm using it, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not good. Like it's scary, it really is. Cause you don't wanna be the guy holding your bare bones iPad. Like, come on, that, if you drop this thing, so what I started doing is I would start to take off the iPad, close the case, and go ahead and write on the iPad like that. So let me show you guys what I mean really quick. Okay, so let's say I need to take notes on this really quick. Let's, let's just see what I would do. So first I would take off the iPad, close up the case, and I would put the iPad directly on the case like that. And that allowed me to have a good writing surface. But the only problem is now, if I somehow forget that my iPad is on the case like this, if I have like a little bump, or something like that, it's, it's just gonna fly off. And also if you pick this up, the iPad is gonna slide right off. There's no magnets holding it in place here, which would actually be a really cool feature if they put magnets like here, or I, I actually don't know how they would do it, but it would like magnetize itself onto the case so it wouldn't just fall right off. That'd be, that's a pretty good feature. So yeah, this is a solution, don't get me wrong, 
but I think there can be a better way of doing this. And my, oh, I'm in eraser mode. <laughs> I think there could totally be a more efficient way of, uh, of writing on the iPad like this. Okay, so I have two more topics to cover in this video, and one of the two is the trackpad itself. And I wanna talk about the trackpad because iPad and trackpad was never a thing up until I believe iOS 13 or iPad OS 13 point something. I'm not, I'm not too sure, but I know it was like a really random release where they introduced mouse support. Even though it was accessibility, it was still technically mouse support. Then obviously with iPad OS 14, they introduced like the real mouse support. Maybe I have that mixed up. Yeah, I think they released like the accessibility mode mouse support in iPad OS 13. And then they released the real mouse support because the Magic Keyboard came out before iPad OS 14. I have no idea that, that there's a lot of stuff going on. But the reason why I want to talk about the trackpad is because apps need to specifically support the trackpad. And I know there's a lot of articles online about the best iPad apps that support the trackpad. But the fact of the matter is that if your favorite app or the app that you need to work doesn't utilize the trackpad that well, it's gonna really break the immersion of using the whole Magic Keyboard. Now there's one app that I struggled with that didn't support the trackpad, and that was the whole Office Suite. It was fixed now, so you can use Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, Excel, and everything with proper mouse support. You can like scroll through it, it'll go to like a little line to show that you're selecting text or something. That, that's good enough for me. But you need to check to see if you're gonna buy this thing, if the app that you need it to work for, if you know what app at least, supports the trackpad because there still are developers that aren't supporting the trackpad and I could see why. I mean, I don't think most of the market is using the Magic Keyboard. Most of the market is using like the base model iPad or the iPad Air that just came out or at most using like a folio keyboard or something like that. I don't see a lot of people using the Magic Keyboard still, at least out in the real world, which I haven't been into recently. So I take back what I said, I actually can't speak for that, but I don't think I've seen people using the Magic Keyboard unless you're looking for it. Like if I'm on the iPad Pro subreddit or the iPad subreddit, everyone's using Magic Keyboards there because it's just kind of like, they all just want to show off their Magic Keyboard and it's beautiful, I love that. But one thing that this thing has that I will never get over, and it's something that I really love about the MacBook Air 2, the one that I reviewed like a couple days ago or something like that, I think a week ago now, is the trackpad gestures. So the whole gesture support for this guy really makes the whole iPad experience so much better in my opinion. It's the same thing as if you would have like a five finger swipe or four finger swipe, I think. I'm actually not, do I forget everything? Okay, so four finger drag out is to open up the app switcher. Same thing with three finger swipe up with the trackpad. So it does a similar thing. Two finger swipe to the side, scrolls through the pages. It's it's just, it's really fluid. Like everything works really well with the trackpad. And I think it's, it adds so much to the iPad user experience. And it's something that without the trackpad, I feel like I'm just missing with the iPad. Like, yes, you could do four finger swipe in to go to your app switcher. I never do that though. I have to like swipe up, hold it, do that. And it's just a lot better and easier in my opinion when you could just do everything from the trackpad, like everything you need to do. Overall though, trackpad, perfect. Okay, now the final topic I wanna talk on in this video, and it's because I have actual experience with it now, so that's really cool, is the iPad Pro or iPad Air or iPad in general versus any type of MacBook, whether it be the Pro, the Air, that's it actually. You're not comparing the iPad to the Mac Pro. No one's doing that. So my general consensus, and maybe I'll go deeper into a different video with this, is that if you need really, really specific apps for your professional life or your school life or something like that, if you're doing a specific major, you need apps for it, you need to go with the MacBook still. There isn't enough support for like web apps yet for those types of like really specific apps. And even if they do have web apps, they're usually not optimized at all. So it's just really difficult to use with the iPad and like the smaller screen size once you get the 12.9 inch, but then you might as well just get a laptop anyway, in my opinion. The only reason why I would ever choose an iPad over a MacBook is if you're just doing like general productivity tasks, like word processing. Uh, if they have apps for your professional career on the iPad Pro, you could definitely use those. This is still an amazing device to use. And I honestly enjoy using this so much more than my MacBook. But the fact of the matter is that the MacBook could still do so much more, at least for what I need it for. There are workarounds like video editing. There's LumaFusion on the iPad, but I just don't wanna learn a whole new editing platform. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe it's so much better on the iPad, but I just can't bring myself to do it. So the general consensus is if you need very specific apps that you don't think exist on the iPad, just go for the MacBook, save yourself the headache of trying to find workarounds and trying to make it work. But if you don't, and you want this like a, a super fun device that you could just do anything and everything with, including taking notes, watching Netflix, playing games, like just everything, iPad Pro with the Magic Keyboard, with the Apple Pencil, definitely the way to go in my book. Keep in mind though, one last thing, if you do go the iPad route, you will probably end up paying more than you would going for the MacBook route. The base model for the MacBook Air starts at $1,000, 
The base model for the iPad Pro, I believe, starts at 800. I think for the iPad Air, it's 600. But throw on the Magic Keyboard, throw on the Apple Pencil, you're paying at least the amount of the MacBook, if not more. So just keep in mind that. You can basically guarantee yourself future-proofing with the MacBook, but there's no promise of some software that you need in the future being available on the iPad. And that's pretty much it. So thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, please consider leaving the video a like and consider subscribing as it would greatly, greatly benefit the channel, like I said before. And let me know what you guys prefer in the comments, whether you like having your iPad more, your MacBook more, or if you bought the Magic Keyboard, what you think of it, because I will always be weary about a $300 to $350 keyboard. So I want to hear your guys' opinion on it as well. But thank you for watching, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Peace out.